This is Dateline News and Conversation. There's an awful lot going on in our world today. Um, probably the biggest story is what's happening in Israel. We'll focus on that later in the week. But tonight, my guests are Kostas Izikos from Greece, Blas Kauchik from Slovenia, and hopefully Hendrik Weber from Norway will join us shortly. We're going to focus on European news and Ukraine. I think the big story in terms of the EU, NATO, and Ukraine is coming from France. Um, President Macron. We're going to talk about this first. He has been calling for NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine. He called a special meeting in Paris of the representatives from the EU and NATO trying to convince them to send troops to Ukraine. I'm going to begin tonight with Kostas. Kostas, what's your take on the French president wanting to send troops from Paris and other NATO countries to Ukraine? Well, uh, this analysis is not easy uh, analysis because it's a complex way to try to understand uh, President Macron's policy. Uh, first of all, we must take a look within the domestic picture, the atmosphere, the political atmosphere in France. He's trailing in the polls uh, quite a lot. Uh, he's in almost a second or a third party. He's very unpopular in France among the medium and uh, working class uh, because of the very, very bad economic situation in the whole of the European Union, and especially in France. So he has adopted, in contradiction to what he used to say two or three years ago, we must remember the phrase that Macron uh, made quite an impact uh, in the world media when he mentioned and he uh, told us that NATO was brain dead, if we can remember this phrase that he used, and that this military alliance was no use for the European Union, and that France was uh, considering to... Uh, have a different architecture in its um, policy for defense within the European Union. Now we have a 180 degree different uh, policy. So one thing is sure, uh, for sure, that is not very consistent on his qualifications and an analysis towards NATO. The second is that France is trying to maintain a foothold in the west of Africa. Uh, it, it's an old colonial power and a very decadent uh, situation and process in the last uh, uh, 50 years or so. So um, adopting a more uh, belligerent uh, stand towards the Russian Federation and for Ukraine uh, surely means that he's pleading for uh, more conservative voters, perhaps, or warlike voters, or voters that could sympathize with him, along with the protection that Washington could perhaps give him um, some other European partners who might um, uh, feel uh, at home with his analysis, mostly the Scandinavian countries and the Eastern European countries. I'm referring to Poland, to Romania, uh, perhaps Bulgaria, and of course, uh, the Baltic countries. So Macron, uh, actually has no consistency on law or logic because this position actually means not only a conflict which would be similar to the beginning or the preamble of a third world war in Europe on the European continent because we know very well that European troops officially if they do land if they do have a presence in Ukraine of course we have thousands and thousands of European mercenaries which actually is in reality European troops in an informal way 
But formally speaking, if he does adopt and other European countries support this position, this puts in Europe, this puts Europe in 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 the roadway on a roadway to hell, and not only Europe but the whole world. So um, it's very very interesting and also very surprising that this president, who mentioned uh, a, a few weeks ago this position, has no support whatsoever in most of the European peoples. Um, I'm talking about the European Union members, uh, the people themselves, and mostly the polls. In Greece, for example, we have 85% uh, in a poll recently asking if Greece would send troops to Ukraine, and almost 85% of Greeks said that would, this would be completely illogical and crazy. So um, Macron's uh, political analysis lacks logic, uh, uh, logic. Uh, it lacks uh, reasoning, it lacks seriousness, and I believe he's under the um, um, uh, temperature of losing the elections, the losing the European elections in a very, very bad way. So I think he's uh, adopting any type of um, uh, illogical reasoning and uh, policies that could hinder uh, Europe today, the European Union. And when I speak of the European Union, I do not speak about Europe because Europe is a geographical uh, description uh, from Lisbon to almost to the Euros. Russia is part of the, of the European continent. It's a Eurasian country. It's part, it has, uh, it has a foothold culturally, geographically, and historically speaking for more than a thousand years in Europe. So when Macron talks about Europe, uh, he must specify Euro-Atlantic Europe, NATO Europe, and not Europe as a whole, because Europe as a whole has nothing to do with this policy of warmongering and, um, and uh, on the precipice of, of uh, total extinction of humanity if this uh, um, position ever, uh, ever uh, did happen as a reality. That's very interesting, Kostas. Uh, he is under tremendous pressure in his own country. He's very unpopular. Um, I'm just wondering if he's uh, somehow reading a script that's written for him by Washington, D.C. or somebody over there. Um, it certainly is a very dangerous position. Uh, Blush, what's your take on Macron? And these statements about uh, sending, formally sending troops uh, to Ukraine, what, what, what do you make of it? Well, first of all, I think it's um, necessary to ask ourselves, uh, are the leaders of three biggest European countries, Germany, France, United Kingdom, are they really personalities, political architects, are, the, are they visionaries who have their own visions and would like to implement them and present them and negotiate about their visions? Or are we dealing with something else? And uh, I would like to add a few thoughts uh, uh, at the beginning uh, to position ourselves correctly when we comment all this um, important events which you have proposed to discuss today. So... Um, I will try to, to uh, explain a few uh, thoughts which we do not hear from the most, uh, uh, from the greatest pundits of today. Uh, and um, uh, they don't know, or they don't, don't see, or they don't want to see. Uh, so I would invite all of us to stop ignoring the obvious uh, and stop playing their game. Uh, one concrete example to uh, to, to illustrate what I have in my mind initially is a discussion among John Mirsheimer, Alexander Mercurius, and Glenn Deason. Very, very interesting discussion. And I uh, even at one point, Deason used the term delusional in connection to geopolitics of today. Um, but then he did not elaborate more in detail. And... Um, now, uh, if we want to, uh, to analyze what is going on with the most important pundits today, we can uh, take a statement 
of Mirschheimer when he said, you have Germans and French at each other's throats. And another statement, Europe is a bunch of countries that have different interests. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting, sounds very dramatic, but is it true? Is it the main controversy of today? Um, 68 million French against 83 million Germans. Is this the problem? Uh, do we not see the destructive role of both governments working in parallel against their own people? Has a C-19 project kicked off in 2019 not opened our eyes to see more clearly what is really going on? Who is doing what against whom? Who are our friends? Who are enemies? Who are traitors? collaborators and agents. Uh, what categories are the big pundits uh, conflating in a way that is just another false flag operation? I propose the short answer. No, it's not the Germans against the French. It's globalists against all of us and the planet. And uh, <laughs> there is a written declaration of global war against the people and the planet, and it has a title. The title is Agenda 2030, and no big pundits even touches this subject, but it's, everything is written in there. So we have to understand first that every war of today, each pandemic, health crisis, genocides, wildfires, is part of the controlled demolition of human society. They are executing digital transformation of uh, normal human society into centrally operated end computer. And this is well researched. Alison McDowell, for instance, documents all the institutions, money flows, conferences, individuals, but most of the alternative uh, is ignoring the obvious. It is not America or the West against the majority of the world, it's globalists against the humanity and nature. And uh, of course, we should ask ourselves, is Russia on our side, on side of the people? I think we are still waiting and hoping for a declaration of departure from Agenda 2030 by Russia and China. Uh, I come from a country, small country, Slovenia, which has historically had a lot of respect and appreciation of Russian culture. There are memorials documenting friendship of the two nations from the First and Second World War. For the future, uh, I see cooperation between sovereign <coughs> European states and Russia as vital, uh, very important for citizens of Europe, Russia, and the rest of the world. But let's not ignore the obvious here. People and institutions who have created the existential crisis we are in will not negotiate a solution because they are achieving what they wanted. General poisoning, robbing and killing of the population. So this would be my general framework of thinking and then I will maybe only have a few short thoughts on, on the concrete individual questions you have posed. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble with my mouse. It's jumping all over the place today. I don't know what's causing you that. Should buy, you should buy a cat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Blush, as usual, you take us to the big picture, and I, I think that's extremely important. Um, but I, I, I want to bring this back you mentioned that it's not France against Germany. But the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was that Olaf Scholz in Germany publicly is feuding with Macron. He, he, he does not want to send formal troops to Ukraine. Um, the two of them obviously are not friends, but they're on 
both ends of a certain spectrum. Nevertheless, Macron and Schultz, and I think probably the UK, all are in agreement or are, are talking about sending long range missiles to Russia. Now, if we can keep it on this level just just for a while longer and and not be looking at this bigger picture that Blush was talking about, what does this mean in reality? That the three of those countries seemingly are willing to send more of their long-range missiles to Ukraine to use against Russia. And the one thing that I want to point out and, and ask your opinion on, it's been fairly well reported that the Ukrainians, number one, are not the ones who are arming and, and uh, repairing these facilities that launch these missiles. Ukrainians just don't have that capability, probably don't have enough people left. So, Blas, I'll start with you this time. Uh, what are your thoughts on this feud between Schultz and Macron? Does it have any real significance? And what are your thoughts on the three of them, including the UK, wanting to send long-range missiles to Ukraine? Well, what I was trying to describe before, and I, I know it's hard because uh, uh, we are all uh, sort of hypnotized in a matrix, uh, is that uh, it is uh, just a spectacle, just a play, uh, that uh, Germany, France, and United Kingdom do not have uh, the will of their own. Their leadership, their governments have been uh, carefully selected and through last 15 years, all the national states have been um, have been um, uh, taken over with leaderships who are absolutely loyal to the globalist headquarters. And what we are watching, uh, to, uh, you mentioned Israel, Gaza, maybe we will see Taiwan tomorrow, what we see uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, what we see in Kosovo, it's all uh, part of... Uh, prepared scenario and the uh, actors on the scene from Zelensky to uh, Sunak, they are, they are performing according to the orders they receive. So they are not acting according to the national interests of their states. And if we go one step further, also United States is not working for the national interests of the citizens of United States. Uh, that's... Uh, I know that it may, it may be more dramatic and interesting to listen to the uh, sports, uh, uh, sports style like comments of Scott Ritter and, uh, and other people. I also listen to them carefully and with great interest. But um, if you ask me, I'm more interested in systemic, uh, systemic forces and uh, 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 from behind that are really calling the shots. And uh, uh, to be concrete, I am uh, I'm personally convinced that the threat of nuclear war is just an instrument to frighten people. It will not happen, as will general elimination of electrical generally, uh, energy not happen, because then the hypnosis would, uh, would stop. Uh, uh, nuclear threat, yes, uh, to a certain extent uh, it is real, but we should never forget the cooperation on the nuclear field uh, throughout the Cold War between American and Soviet experts. And uh, uh, we, should we should maybe look into what Institute Shkolkovo is doing today in Moscow. Uh, so I think all, all this also threats now we have been hearing today very much about the attacks of uh, uh, Ukrainians in Belgorod and uh, threatening also the nuclear uh, uh, security. Yeah, to a certain extent it is, it is real, but I don't believe in a nuclear threat uh, more than a tool 
to scare the population of the world and to make it more obedient. Oh, you, you mentioned a couple of really important things. Um, that um, all of this is a three ring circus performance uh, that uh, we're, we're being um, entertained by, distracted by. And bless you, you, you point out consistently that the representatives of the United States, France, Germany, uh, the UK, Finland, Sweden, all of these countries are not representing their people. They are all actors who are playing a role. I think that's important to keep emphasizing over and over and over again. And when we talk about these different acts in the play that we're talking about tonight, Macron and Schultz, that they look like they're in a feud, and yet they're really on the same page. The same thing with the UK. We'll discuss in a few minutes some other countries in Europe that are actors in this play. And I think it's very important to keep bringing that out. Costas, I'm coming to you now for your thoughts on this. Well, I think that uh, I, I cannot disagree uh, that uh, Mr. Macron and Mr. Schultz are on the same uh, highway. They have uh, a very uh, equal strategy towards the Russian Federation and towards the East in general and the South. Uh, so uh, the disagreements that are pointed out perhaps are tactical disagreements or sometimes overplayed by the European uh, Union media and the conglomerates who like to play on these things and to minimize the real problem, as it was said. So I do agree that um, Mr. Schultz, for example, I would like to uh, uh, say a few things about uh, this person, this political leader, so-called leader, who has led for the first time after the Second World War the German economy to su a suicidal policy. Nord Stream destroyed. The biggest energy partner of Germany, the Russian Federation, destroyed. The uh, expansioning uh, process of German exports are being slow, uh, destroyed. Uh, they're losing ground everywhere uh, to their competitors in this uh, world capitalized uh, global system. So we have a militarization of German economy and a militarization of the European economy at the same time. This is suicidal for the European people because they're losing ground on social economic services, which are almost non-existent today. Uh, so uh, when Greece was at the brink of becoming a colony, which it did become a colony of the Troika in 2015, uh, after the first series of government by Tsipras uh, went down on their knees towards the Troika and Washington. Now we see the whole European Union following the paths of Greece, where the economy is being destroyed, um, the, ind the industry is being destroyed, and militarization um, is, 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 is so, so to a, such a point that dependency, energetic dependency on Washington and other players in the Arab world is total now. Germany keeps buying Russian oil, but it's coming through China and India, and it's paying 120 or 130 percent more the barrel that it costs on international level. So the suicide goes on and on and on by Mr. Schultz. But I am not scared of Mr. Schultz. For me, the danger in the political scene and the so-called political leaders of Germany is Mrs. Anna Burbach, <laughs> perhaps the worst warmonger in the European Union, who could be a clone of Victoria Nuland at any time. So we do have these puppets, these war hawk puppets, which have been trained, we have, which have studied in the United States, in special schools, in, in special agencies, and so on, and then they're brought back here like our Prime Minister, Mr. Mitsotakis, and the previous Prime Minister, Jorpa Pandreo, and, this, 
and the new uh, puppet, uh, Mr. Kasalakis, who is a, a Greek American political leader in the official opposition. So we're being flooded by uh, American uh, European leaders or European leaders with um, a Washington logic and a Washington way of thinking, uh, deep state Washington way of thinking, Euro-Atlantic NATO way of thinking. So this is suicidal for the whole of Europe. And if the European people do not rise, and I mean practically and politically and socially uh, and um, academically, uh, also, uh, we have all these uh, structures within the European societies that have to rise up against the suicide of the European Union, or we will be a landscape like the moon. Um, and uh, it will be a terrible thing to happen uh, at the beginning of the 21st century if the first continent that commits political, environmental, social, and economic suicide is the European Union. And they're on that way very fast. You mentioned a couple of very important points. <clears throat> uh, the downfall of these European countries and the European Union, uh, you talk about it being suicidal. It's exactly that. Uh, I want to bring that back to what Blush is always saying. Uh, th that is not self-directed. That's coming from some powerful forces that are behind Agenda 2030, that are behind the World Economic Forum, uh, that have in their mind basically to destroy what's left of our humanity. <clears throat> We've talked about this before on other occasions. I want to mention something else, Kostas, that you said. Many of these players have been recruited and trained in the United States. It's amazing the number of leaders and subordinates across the European Union and across the former Soviet republics who have been recruited, trained and prepared and groomed in the United States. Now, I don't know about Finland's foreign minister, this uh, Elena Voltunen, uh, a young woman. I don't know where they come from with no diplomatic experience, no significant experience in government, in military affairs. And she says, Finland, she's speaking as the foreign minister, supports the French position to send troops to Ukraine. This is mind boggling, Finland. And you know, it's the same case in Sweden. It's the same case in Norway, these Scandinavian countries. And of course, the same thing is happening in the Baltics. They have women prime ministers, defense ministers, and they are all in favor of sending troops to Ukraine, which they know will provoke Russia and will provoke World War III. Blas, I want to come back to you for your thoughts on where we're at with that. Yes, well, um, I think... Um Kostas has given a very good um, illustration and analysis of the situation which I was talking about. Uh, maybe just um, additional thought before I, I go to Finland. Uh, he man Kostas mentioned the academia, and I think it's very important uh, question. Uh, unless uh, or until the, the uh, intellectuals uh, do not uh, decide that they will um, abandon the um, dogmas of globalism and uh, the mother of do all dogmas is the dogma of money, the monetary system, which nobody really understands today except for very few people. But this is mother of all dogmas because it makes it possible for everything to be financed the way it is financed today. So uh, as long as the uh, intellectuals of individual national states do not decide that they stop, as uh, Costas correctly described as collective suicide, uh, we should not expect from the population to come up with elaborated solutions. Uh, now uh, to Finland, um, Voltonen, uh, uh, this lady was installed 
to work for the globalists against the Finnish national interests. Finland has been one of the fastest developing countries in 80s with Soviet Union as major partner. Nokia uh, has developed to be leading European high-tech company, major mobile uh, phone industry, telecommunications supplier. And then it has been taken over by Microsoft and cannibalized. And the rest is history. So uh, Finland, from a very uh, perspective, uh, Scandinavian state, has become, um, is becoming a desert and is used um, as, a, as a military outpost against, uh, against Russia, which has to reorganize its military force now also to, uh, to, to be potentially protected against, uh, against the country. Uh, which was always their friend and partner after Second World War. So this is the general uh, situation, and uh, Voltonen is just a good example of obedient uh, European global politicians who are performing their jobs as they are ordered to do. And uh, they are sacrificing their people, and they will co continue to do so until the system of governance of each individual change is uh, done. And this cannot, this will not uh, be done uh, until the NATO is uh, uh, destroyed and a European Union disband and European cooperation built on new mutual interest based interests. Wow. I want to talk about this a little bit more. Um, Blush, you mentioned something about NATO uh, is really coming apart. We can see the cracks everywhere. The same thing in the EU. Um, NATO really, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Warsaw Pact, had no purpose whatsoever. Um, I believe it was used by the United States that needed an enemy to create this force, which we call NATO. And the European Union, I, I'm an American from, uh, the way I look at it is when I look at what's happening today across the European Union, what I see as individual countries having lost their sovereignty to an unelected group of people. Costas, am I totally off base? Or do you see cracks in NATO? Do you see cracks in the EU that are leading to their dissolve and destruction? Your thoughts? Well, I think that the European Union is uh, completely full of black holes. I wouldn't even call them cracks. First of all, look, let's look at the democratic, so-called democratic process of the European Union. None of the European leaders uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, the European Commission, they're not elected by the European people. Uh, they're not even elected by the uh, European Parliament. The European Parliament is a body that cannot exercise political uh, uh, control over the European Union. Even if you look at the architecture of the European Union, it's not on a foundation of democracy, uh, as we call it. It is on a foundation of representatives uh, where behind the curtain, all the agreements are made with the participation of large capital banks, uh, very important people, which uh, are in the so-called dark rooms, which we do not know what they talk about and what they say. So um, the, the question of the so-called free democratic European Union is a joke. It is a real joke. And I'm sorry to say this. Uh, because the sovereignty that the European nations have lost to Brussels has never been disputed by a large number of the political class of the European uh, political geography. Very few have spoken on this. So as long as Europe is on this road of destruction and self-collective suicide, as Blas mentioned, there is no way that the decadent process of destruction can stop. 
what will this bring? That is a big question. But at this point, there has to be three points, in my opinion, that have to be pointed out on this road of self-suicide, collective suicide, and economic, environmental, political destruction of the European Union. The first is that the European Union must start a real negotiation with uh, the Russian Federation, the BRICS, Africa, and Latin America. The European Union is not the center of the world. They must be aware of this. But when they speak as a European Union, as leaders, they think they're the center of the world. And this is also a very bad joke. It's melodramatic. It's tragic when you see Mr. Josep Borrell speaking about freedom. It's tragic when they speak about um, uh, the ongoing genocide in Gaza and Palestine. It's tragic when they do not recognize their criminal uh, behavior in Africa and Latin America after 200 years of colonization and massacres and genocide, which has never been brought up in any international court uh, very few times, very, very few leaders around the world, especially in the 20th century. So the European Union does not represent the European people. It represents uh, Euro-Atlantic interests, Washington's interests, military interests, and the so-called dream of destruction of an antagonistic pole in the world, which they see with great fear, economically, politically, socially, energetically, um, uh, scientifically, and so on. So they're political dwarfs. They're real political dwarfs, which uh, they live, they think they're habitating in a planet of giants. And they're, and they're very minuscule, very, very unimportant in, in, in world figures as far as economy is concerned, as far as production is concerned, even as culture and science is concerned. And I finish by, by um, stating that the biggest blunt of decadence and uh, self-destruction is the question of Mrs. von der Leyen, who was perhaps the most corrupt European leader since the start of the European Union, which has been uh, not smeared, but um, attacked uh, with uh, a lot of proof, it seems. But this has been put aside by the media conglomerates and the political classes when she um, accepted billions and billions of, of, of uh, money being poured into Pfizer for buying vaccines not even through the negotiation process, which is stated under European Union law, and where she has been um, pointed out as one of the persons uh, and her husband, who is a Pfizer uh, top chief in Europe, uh, gaining from this process, not only money, but gaining political influence and economic power. And if you break down the process, in many European countries, you see many Mrs. and Mr. von der Leyen's. You see many of them all over. Macron, um, uh, Mitsotakis in Greece, Meloni in Italy, and so on. The, the list is, 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 is it's not ending. So corruption and decadence are, are, are real. And you will not see any European court. You will not see any European uh, people uh, within the justice, justice system talk about this because this is not democracy. It's fake democracy. It's iconic democracy. It's epidemic democracy. It's not real democracy. Thank you, Kostas. Blas, what are your thoughts? Is the European Union falling apart? Is NATO falling apart? <laughs> is corruption existent at all levels? Uh, um, your thoughts? It is, it is militarily protected, but uh, as long as it does not fall apart, uh, European Union as it is, uh, we are on our way to slavery because uh, Robert Mandel, the author of Euro, famously said uh, that with introduction of Euro, we have finally excluded democracy from uh, running the, I'm pa paraphrasing, democracy of running the uh, European Union. So, um, uh, Euro is uh, is the craziest project of all. Uh, it, it is um, like a monopoly game. Uh, a group of um, a group of selected um, 
uh, mafiosi uh, is um, is creating uh, the tokens and distributing them and uh, th this is this is really a sick situation and now we are confronted with uh, you, the whole Europe uh, through the budgets being pushed into severe militarization. Ursula von der Leyen wants to militarize Europe to support Macron's idea of European army. And it would, uh, if, it, if it materializes, this would be our army against European citizens, not army against anybody else, because it's not capable of, of attacking a, a serious country like Russia, for instance. So, yeah, I agree with everything that Costa said, and I'm just uh, uh, just uh, uh, emphasizing that the monetary system and the monetary sovereignty is the basis of any real democracy. And uh, this uh, question of um, monetary democracy is, uh, is uh, I discuss it in my book in a little bit more detail, the, the, the dogma of money. But the, this is, the, as I said before, dogma of money is uh, mother of all dogmas because it makes material financial uh, basis for everything that the globalists are performing. And finally, meaning that we, the people, we are financing our own destruction, our own demise. And as long as we, don't, we do not uh, uh, wake up the intellectuals in, in, in countries like Greece, Slovenia, Norway, Germany, to prepare a program for first for defense and then for liberation, um, <laughs> we will not move. We should not wait for the people. And uh, I'm, I'm often asking, are we under threat or are we not? If we are under threat, then we have to organize, probably, as we Slovenians did in 1941. By the way, I mean, you know, uh, here behind me is a picture of my father who was 19 years old, and he uh, fired the first shot on the first front, frontal uh, battle against uh, Nazi Germany. It was in January 1942. And maybe it had a little bit to do, it helped a little bit the Battle of Stalingrad, which was, uh, which was going on in 1942, and uh, which was the critical moment uh, when, the, when the Nazis started to lose their momentum. So in 1941, our uh, predecessors uh, knew what to do. They organized for defense and liberations, and now... It, now the situation is much more complicated uh, because of all this uh, media and digitalization and wokeness and uh, all this uh, Hollywood and all these uh, games and uh, Djokovic and uh, uh, tennis and ATP and this and that. Uh, people are people are too busy with with um, with um, uh, banalities, uh, and when it becomes critical when you are uh, robbed or shot, <laughs> it's too late. So um, uh, I apologize, but I try to use each opportunity to, 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 to ignite a little bit uh, of, a, of, a, of a spark <laughs> of organization, because without organization, we will not get anywhere. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, my good friend, Bruce Gagnon, who's with us on occasion, has been a, an organizer for his entire adult life, uh, dating back to somewhere in the 1980s. And his motto is educate and organize now. And that's what I think we have to hope for. Uh, Hendrik Weber has been able to join us. Hendrik, I'm sure you've picked up on the conversation. I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the, the dissolution uh, of the EU and NATO uh, in light of the suicidal tendencies as Blush and Kostas have both talked about. What are your thoughts? Sorry, I'm a little bit late. <laughs> um, okay, the European Union, uh, Costa and Blush have already said uh, a lot of things about it and I agree completely. 
Uh, it's uh, more or less a, a clown show, but uh, clowns you have on uh, children's birthday parties or something. These clowns in Brussels, they make uh, really dangerous decisions for us all. And uh, that's a big difference. Um, so for me, I'm very glad that Norway not, is not a part of the European Union, but still we are uh, almost a part. And our elites want us to be a part of the European Union because uh, the European, is, European Union or in Brussels is uh, corrupt, <laughs> corrupt as hell. So, and uh, our elites in Norway maybe all, also want to have a piece of this cake. Um, so, I think the most people in Norway don't want to be a part of the European Union because they know and they understand that uh, we will give away a lot of our independence. Um, but I think people in, in other countries, I'm not really sure if they understand when I see newspaper articles, for example, in, in Germany, um, it, it looks like that the people are brainwashed to think that the European Union is the only hope for peace in the world, in, in Europe. Um, so I think it's a, it's a little bit difficult situation, but uh, when you ask me personally, I would shut down the European Union or a whole Brussels <laughs> tomorrow. Um, I, I, I think that would be best. And it doesn't mean that we then we have war the next day, because the European Union was not there all the time. Um, I think these countries uh, could still work together uh, and, and trade is always always a way to avoid uh, war and confrontation between countries. <clears throat> and uh, this was, would not stop. And, and all these lies we are hearing, hearing about, oh, without the European Union, we cannot trade together and everything is, it would be difficult. It was not difficult before. Uh, we have also traveled and we have uh, transferred our cash uh, <clears throat> in other currencies. Uh, when we traveled to another country, it was not a problem. And the banking system was working also before the European Union. But I think a, a lot of people are brainwashed in all these years to think <clears throat> that the European Union is the only hope for, for us in Europe. Um, it's very interesting, um, and it's very alarming, and it's all being orchestrated by these people have names, but very powerful people who have, as Blas keeps reminding us, uh, the mother of all doctrines, money. It's money that's behind all of it and money that is not in humanity's best interest. I think we can all agree with that. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and I, I, I want to focus on an article that I read today on RT, which, by the way, is banned in Europe. And I want to start with our good friend Hendrik Weber. Um, there was an article today in Telegram about Hendrik, about he and his family who have um, suffered because of his opinions on Russia and specifically the return of Crimea to Russia. And the article that I read today was about a new Media Freedom Act in the EU. And when I read the article, it's got nothing to do with freedom and freedom of speech. It's got everything to do with censorship. Hendrik, I want to come to you first. I'd like you to explain how you've been censored and banned and your thoughts on this new media Freedom Act in the EU. What does it mean? 
Uh, it, it's like in, in the book 1984. You can change all the words or, or turn them around, and then you have the 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 real meaning of it. Uh, freedom is it, it means the opposite. Uh, it means censorship. Um, I don't want to say so much about myself, but um, I've traveled to Crimea since 2016, and I've okay. I have supported uh, the the reunification of Crimea with Russia, and I've written a book about this in in 2019, <laughs> and. Um, uh, the newspapers in Norway are writing about me that I'm a Putinista, of course, that I'm paid by the Kremlin, that uh, I get funded from, from Russia and all these kind of lies. But it's like always, uh, they have no facts. There are no facts. They're only coming with some pieces um, putting out of, of an interview or, or something and say, here, look, he, he is a, a, a pro-Kremlin uh, troll or whatever. Um, in the last years, there was a lot of articles uh, about me and my family in uh, Norwegian media, also on TV. Um, uh, my, my wife, for example, lost her job uh, because of me. Um, my children or our children uh, got some problems because of uh, my activities. Uh, and I, of course, lost uh, a lot of customers uh, in my business. Uh, so it's a, it's a really a difficult situation. And of course, it would get even more worse in 2022 when uh, Russia started this military operation. Um, even if I've never said I support uh, the war against Ukraine or something, but it gets it, it got a lot worse and really crazy in the internet. Uh, we got uh, uh, death threats uh, by mail, by email, by telephone. Uh, so it's a really crazy situation. And um, not only my wife, but also my, my children are afraid sometimes. And uh, yeah, that's that's a freedom of speech we are living in in Norway. If you mean exactly the same as all the others, then everything is okay. But if you have a little bit other <coughs> opinion, then uh, you are in in real danger. <clears throat> um, so of course, all these laws uh, and all these ideas of the European Union, but also on. on from the Norwegian government, these are completely crazy and turn everything upside down. When they talk about freedom, it has nothing to do with freedom of speech. When they talk about we want to fight against uh, racism or, or something, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, you can easily turn around these sentences and these words and you get the real meaning of, the, of these laws or articles or interviews, whatever they they uh, say. But also here, it's a problem, I think, that we have to have really independent and really strong alternative media because people are not aware about this. When I talk even to friends or my family, they say, yes, but maybe you have to, to, um, uh, um, to, to avoid to say this or that on the interview or something, or, or yeah, maybe. Uh, the newspaper did a little bit wrong in this or that, but normally the TV and the media stations and all these guys are working very correctly. So it's if you are not in into this by yourself, it's almost impossible to understand how the media system works, and um, that is really difficult, of course, for normal people who has normal work and normal life. Um, it, it's it's uh, really difficult to understand how media can destroy you if they want. Um, so, in my in my case, I'm thinking about to to move to another country um, because uh, it's not only me. I'm only I'm only a small light in, in Norway. There are other people who are uh, more important. 
uh, and even they when i talk to them they tell me the same thing if they are thinking about to move to other countries where there is a really real freedom of speech or, or even you are not getting so hated by uh, the public opinion as in in no way in, in such a small country thank you for that personal testimony hendrik i think it's very important for people to not only understand but to meet people like you who have felt the strong arm of the censors in a number of countries it's the same thing in my country in the united states um, in fact in the united states there's no more freedom of speech um, there are three distinct acts uh, the patriot act the national defense authorization act and the domestic terrorist act <clears throat> which means that anybody who speaks against the government narrative is a domestic terrorist, and that's a criminal offense. They can arrest you. They don't even have to bring you to trial. They just hide you away somewhere. And when we're talking about censorship, I mean, look what they, they're doing to Julian Assange, who created no crime. All he did was reveal a horrific crime of the United States. And this is what we're up against. And people say, well, I, I, I really don't have to worry. I'm not anybody who's really important. So I'm, I'm not worried about my freedom of speech being taken away. Edward Snowden said, all of us have got to be afraid of this. Costas, I want to come to you. You two have been very active in Crimea. Greek heritage in Crimea goes back thousands of years. Your comments now on censorship across the EU, but if you want to pick up on what Hendrik said, but you've experienced as, as, as well, Crimea's return to Russia. Take it away. Well, well first of all, let me uh, speak from my heart first. Uh, all my uh, solidarity and my support to Hendrik uh, and his family and to all other people anywhere in the European Union who are being persecuted, not just censored, they are being persecuted economically, socially. And when you mentioned Assange, uh, they go even as far as the physical disappearance. They go as far as killing a process of, uh, of physical disappearance through a so-called judicial system, which is nothing else than a bubble where uh, a person is uh, living 23 hours per day for years now uh, under solitary confinement with serious psychological problems and health problems. And then you have no European so-called uh, NGOs or, or, or green lovers or lovers of human rights who can even say the word Assange. Uh, so what Hendrik mentioned about his personal persecution in Norway is something that is being uh, uh, driven across all over the European Union to many of us. Uh, there, of course, there are different levels depending on each person and each country's difference and the social and the political uh, differences between country and country. Uh, here in Greece, we belong to a, a membership of about 200 people, former um, uh, members of parliament like myself or former ministers who cannot appear on television anymore, on, on media television, on the systemic media as we call it, but only on alternative media. Uh, they, they have told us this directly that you cannot get on the show. Unfortunately, we cannot put you on the show because um, your opinions are not, uh, are not approved. And what type of freedom is this when they, they say directly to you? So Crimea, and I will finish with Crimea. I have met Hendrik and other fellow comrades and friends in Crimea since 2015-16. We've been there many times. What does Crimea depict? What does the Crimea show? Not only a reunification with the Russian Federation, but the protection of a region with more of than 52 different cultural and linguistic uh, differences. Would this have happened under Ukraine, under the Nazi Kiev system? Of course not. Of course not. 
Russia, Russian language is forbidden now in Ukraine as, as Greek and, and gypsy language and other linguistic uh, minorities are not allowed to speak their own languages. They're not allowed to teach them in schools. They're not allowed to read them in their own newspapers. While in Crimea, all the minorities enjoy full rights. And that, that is why the word Krim in Turkish, which means jewel, remains a jewel of, 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 of protection of all minorities and true democracy, of social, political, and economic uh, light. So this is what Crimea has achieved. It's not a perfect region. It's not a perfect society. But it's a society which is much closer to people's dreams and realities than we're living through here in the West, in the European Union, and in my country, in Greece, where anybody, anybody who writes an article or writes a book, whether he's an academic or an intellectual, is called a Putinist agent or a Russian agent. If it disagrees with the military destruction of Europe and the military confrontation with Russia, which is the, if you're, if you're in favor of that, you'll be on the news every day. You'll be on, on every show, every panel, every day in the radio and the television systemic conglomerates. So the Freedom Act of the European Union, in reality, is a new censorship act towards all people who have different views, different opinions, and who are not entitled to voice them. So this is, what else, but a digital dictatorship of one point of view, of one political view, whether you have many political parties, they all agree on the same strategy. Yes for NATO, yes for Washington, yes for Brussels. Brussels. These are the three yes of the political ruling classes and not of the people of the European Union. Thanks for that, Kostas. I do want to point out this is the 10th anniversary of the return of Crimea to Russia. We're celebrating that now. There'll be big, all kinds of celebrations, I think, coming up on Monday and next week. Uh, I've been living here for four years. And Kostas, Hendrik, you know, I can say from my own experience that life in Crimea has been improved 100% since the return to Russia. Economically, billions of rubles being invested here. Construction is happening everywhere. New hospitals, new schools, new roads. And, and the spirit of the people uh, is one of, as Kostas pointed out, harmony. Many different cultures and religions living in harmony here in Crimea, not being persecuted. People are free to practice whatever religion they want. They're free to speak whatever they want to speak. And there aren't too many people that I know of who are speaking against the Russian Federation. And so this is the 10th anniversary. Uh, Blush, I want to come to you for your final comments on this new European Media Freedom Act and what it means for all of us, really. I think uh, most of the um, things have been said by, by Kostas and Hendrik, so I agree with that. Uh, it is uh, uh, it's totally unacceptable. And uh, it is uh, it is a Orwell's uh, double double speak uh, to um, uh, uh, regarding uh, regarding the freedom. It is it is the banning banning of speech, and I have personally had also experience a um, uh, couple of times in my career when I was um, destroyed by the media and um, media lies and so on. So I I understand perfectly well what what. Uh, Hendrik is, is going on. And I can only hope that the worse the things are getting, the more people will start understanding that we have to stand up, organize, and fight. And regarding, uh, uh, regarding Crimea, of course, the three of you have uh, 
uh, very deep knowledge and personal experience. I have nothing much to add, uh, maybe just that annexation or reunification of Crimea was supported by the referendum. But it was, uh, basically it was, uh, this process was a consequence, as I see, of unprovoked offensive of NATO against Russia. So the rest was reaction. Well, I want to thank the three of you for this fascinating in-depth discussion tonight. Um, we'll look forward to doing this again, as I always do on Sunday evenings, to the extent that the three of us can get together. Thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. We'll see you again next week.